Nicola, Socrates, where'd the nickname come from? And then we'll jump into your background. Well, <laughs> there's a long story and a short story be behind the nickname, but Basically, I guess you can say by nature or from at least if not by nature from a very early age, I was kind of always asking uncomfortable questions, questioning things, pushing for alternatives and, you know, in time people had called me the opposition uh, <laughs> and other things like that and eventually it got to one occasion where while I was in the army somebody called me Socrates. And it kind of stuck because, you know, originally I was fighting it. I was not too happy about it. Plus, I didn't think it was actually proper or earned. But then eventually I got to the moment where I was like, well, you know what? I didn't come up with this. Whether it's true or false, it's for others to decide. So instead of fighting it, uh, fighting it I might as well embrace it. And then people would prejudge you anyway, what, whatever you do. So I'll just go with the flow and see where it takes us. How very Socrates of you. That's a, <laughs> that's a very stoic movement. So your, your background is ethics and humanities, right? Well, actually, my undergraduate degree was political sci science, philosophy, and economics. But my, I started as pure philosophy student, and they, then my uh, philosophy advisor criticized me that only bad philosophers only do philosophy. So if I wanted to be a good philosopher, he told me, uh, I had to solve my biggest problem, which was I had too much philosophy on my plate. So he invited me to jump into other fields, uh, enjoy the world, learn about the world from other points of view, and thus I changed my major from pure philosophy to political science and economics. Because my original interest was in ethics, but at least in theory, politics should be the place where you apply ethics, right? In theory, right? <laughs> at least in theory, and then on top of it, you can't actually do politics unless you have at the very least a basic understanding of economics, because the economic foundation is the kind of the foundation for the material society at least, and therefore I ended up with what is classically referred to as PPE. Interesting, and it, um, it makes perfect sense, the logic that you went through. and. Somehow that brings you to today. What is your job title? How do you describe yourself to people? <laughs> well, it depends if I'm pitching or if I'm not pitching. But generally, if I'm uh, talking to an event planner, I would say that I'm a keynote speaker who helps event planners uh, create events focus, focused on the dangers and opportunities of new technology. Uh, but more broadly speaking, I'm just uh, the man with the questions. I'm just curious about who we are and where we're going. And that's both individually for me as a person, but also collectively for us as a species, uh, as, a, as a society, as a civilization, if you will. And so, you know, you can call me a seeker, you can call me a Socrates, you can call me a curious person. That's basically I, the way I see it. And, of course... Evaluating yourself is the hardest thing to do, so it could very likely be the furthest thing from the truth, actually, but at least that's how I perceive it and how I'd like it to be. I feel it, it's exponentially easier or harder being a philosopher. It's very meta to think about yourself. I don't know if that helps or hurts. I think it's harder. I think generally it's very easy to see other people's flaws. It's very hard to see your own flaws. We're all biased. Uh, I'm no exception. And uh, at least for me, it's very hard to look at myself objectively. I either go too harsh on myself, but I think most of the time I'm too soft on myself. So Singularity FM, you start a pretty successful tech podcast. You talk to luminaries. What's the genesis? The genesis was basically that, uh, you know, what is it now? Ten years ago, I think. It was, to my knowledge, the first podcast on the topic of transhumanism and the technological singularity at the time. Uh, basically, around 2004, 2005, I started doing a master's degree thesis in political science, and I read Ray Kurzweil's book, The Singularity is Near. And that book blew my mind. 
And as it happened afterwards, I read another book, which is kind of the same book, but uh, moving from the nonfiction realm into the science fiction realm called um, Accelerando by Charlie Strauss. And when you put these two books, one is the sort of nonfiction version, the other is the fiction version, my mind was completely blown. I was sure that everything in our future is going to change forever. And then when I graduated in, uh, with my master's degree, I couldn't find a job. It was like the peak of the recession, maybe about 2008. I think I stopped counting after 300 resumes and I, didn't, I had one interview which apparently didn't go very well because they never called me back. Uh, and so then I thought, well, if I can't find a job, I might as well try to invent it and create it myself. And what better than continue my work on this, uh, in this field? But actually the occasion was very kind of fortunate for me and again connected to another failure of mine which is the first blog on the topic was called at the time Singularity Hub. And Singularity Hub uh, had an open call for staff writers. And I was thinking, I am perfect. You know, 300 uh, resumes counting and nobody replied or one, one interview. But these guys should be like so happy to have me because, you know, I did my master's degree thesis on the topic. People say I'm a good writer. I have advanced degrees. This was kind of like my area of expertise. I'm perfect. Like they couldn't find a better person than me. So I sent them a, a, my resume and my cover letter. And it took about two weeks to realize they're not calling, calling me back either. And, <laughs> and I was like, wow, even if these guys don't want me, like then what in the world do I do with myself, right? And then a week later, somehow the strange thought occurred into my mind. Well, maybe I don't need them maybe I could start a blog of my own. Maybe it's not so hard. And you know, I was very scared at the time because I had no idea about web design, websites, web pages. And we're talking here 2008, 2009, when it was not so easy as it is today. And I knew nothing. You know, I don't have a technical or engineering or programming background of any kind. So it took me, I think, three months to self-teach myself HTML enough to put my first single-page homepage, <laughs> and another three months to create maybe 50 or 60 pages on my website, which was called Singularity Symposium, and it's still active. I haven't taken it down, but I haven't changed it since then. So for 10 years, it's the same. <laughs> Did you say 50 or 60 pages? Yeah, yeah, 50 or 60 pages on that website. And then uh, about six months after I began my journey, I discovered WordPress. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. If you can type in a Word document, you can actually build your own website and you don't need to struggle with H HTML anymore. This is like genius, right? So I switched from Singularity Symposium, which was HTML based, to singularityweblog.com and launched my WordPress website. And about six months later, around 2009, uh, fall, I think, of 2009, I heard about this crazy thing called podcasting. And I was like, wow, this is so weird, you know. Uh, I'm kind of very scared to give it a try because, you know, I have a Bulgarian accent and people would, of course, prejudge me and say, look, this guy can't even speak proper English without accent. Why would I waste my time listening to him, right? So I was very scared. I had no knowledge of podcasting technology, audio gear of any kind whatsoever. And the thought of video at the time didn't even occur to me because I was scared to get in front of a microphone, let alone in front of a camera, right? But I was like, well, you know, I'm writing everything under an alias called Socrates. And of course, even though I never tried to hide my real name, I was like, so what's the worst thing that could fail? I could fail publicly, big deal, I mean, Anyone, anyway, no one is really, there's like 100 people coming to my website a month. Like, it was pathetic at the time, right? And so I decided I'd give it a try. I started podcasting, uh, and my first podcast was so terrible that I even failed to record the podcast properly. <laughs> like I did a whole interview, and in the end, I go to check out the, the recording file. Oh, it didn't work. Something happened wrong. And it just, I had nothing in the end. So I had to like go and apologize to my first guest and beg him to <laughs> redo the whole interview. Now, luckily for me, he was a very nice guy. 
James Harvey from Australia, and he wrote this book called Singularia. And so we did we redid the whole interview. But then in the process of doing that interview, I discovered it's very hard to do an interview, you know, when two people are at the, the, the two opposite ends of the world without even seeing each other, just without you, because it's hard to time the gaps and the, the silence and when you jump in and stuff. It, it's always so much more helpful if you can actually see the other person. So then I thought, well, why don't I turn on the webcam and you can turn on the webcam and I record both the audio and the video. And then after I ended up with the recording of both the audio and the video, I thought, well, I already have the audio and the video. Why would I post on the audio? I might as well post them both. And so before you realize it, I started doing video podcasting and, and posting the videos on YouTube and the audio on iTunes and everywhere else where you have the audios. And there you go. Ten years later, I have uh, 230. 30, 40 interviews. I have a best-selling book. I had the first, supposedly, or the first, as I said, that I know of, podcast on the topic. And I've met many of the movers and shakers personally, Oops. or at least digitally. So it's been a good journey. What was the most exciting interview? Outside of the first one, which went terrible and didn't actually record, <laughs> and you were scared shitless. Outside of that one. Well... So, you know, <laughs> do you have kids? I knew you were going to go there. You, I'm going to make you pick a favorite kid. You're going to have to be the dad that pisses off the mom. You know, my answer to that question is usually, you know, even if you have kids, it's very hard not to have favorites. But if you actually make that known, either with behavior or let alone with words, all kinds of negative implications would arise, right? So uh, it is very unwise to say among your many children, if you have a few, which one is your favorite and which one is your least favorite. And likewise, with my interviews, I feel that I've put effort to give birth to all of those things to happen. And, you know, many times I failed, a few times I've succeeded, but I've struggled for each of them and I've done my best, usually. So I can't really push it's, it's very unreasonable of me or unwise of me to go and start picking favorites spoken like a true philosopher and if you're listening kids yes he does have a favorite good luck figuring it out so you come at this from a really interesting perspective of philosophy and ethics and from I, i've listened to most of your episodes they're quite good from most of your episodes you play the you play the cynic, you play the critic, the person who tries to find the issues that optimistic technologists often, often overlook. Would you categorize that as correct? Well, mostly yes, but again, my performance is not a steady line. Uh, it fluctuates over time. I have better moments and worse moments. I have interviews where I connect extremely well with the interviewee, and I have moments where I fail to connect completely with them. I have had successes and I have failures. Uh, and so generally my uh, goal is to create a symposium because this is what Socrates was known for. He was the host, uh, or at least symbolically, in Plato's uh, dialogues and most importantly the symposium. Socrates was the host where a bunch of people would go and have fun. And a symposium basically is a drinking party. It's a place where people go to have fun, to eat and drink, while at the same time discussing very important issues such as poetry, love, friendship, religion, uh, ethics, uh, aesthetics, beauty, uh, you know, good and evil and all of those things, death, uh, etc. And Hopefully, at the end of the day, if the host has done a great job, Socrates, that is to say, then he was actually being a midwife to his guests, giving birth to their own ideas. And so at the end of the party, people would not only leave drunk, but hopefully with a new understanding, with at least a little bit of a new insight of the subject that they were discussing. And so that's generally my goal. And that's if I've ever managed to accomplish it, that's accomplished through a sort of a dialectical method of investigation where I question my guests and sometimes I push them 
sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, and as I said, sometimes it's more successful than other times, but that's the goal. For me to be a midwife to my audience to give birth to their own ideas. And you know, I have very strong opinions of mine. I don't hide them, but I don't put them on a pedestal. They're not the right opinion. They're just one bouncing point among many, uh, which hopefully my guests or my audience would consider as one among, among a mosaic of possibilities. And then they would choose for themselves what works for them. I would agree. I would say your opinion becomes more important and relevant the more people you interview because you do pull in those other outside perspectives where you have more to offer than your average Joe on the streets because you've thought about a lot more things. Speaking of, what are some of your more controversial opinions? <laughs> well, uh, so uh, there's been a couple of times where I've gone sort of full out, if, if I may say it that way. But perhaps the, 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 the top two, the first one was uh, a speech that I did in Rotterdam a few years ago. I don't know if it was in 2015 or, or so, uh, called uh, The Emperor Has No Clothes, Socrates Deconstructs Singularity University. Uh, and so after I did that speech there, uh, basically, uh, I kind of got blacklisted by some people and it, it made some pretty powerful people pretty upset. Uh, and they tried to take down my video and, and all kinds of other things ensued. Uh, so that was kind of one of the most controversial ones I've done. And in terms of simply the most heated debate that I've ever had on my actual podcast, uh, was perhaps my debate with uh, Robin Hansen, and I did two or three interviews with him. And I think the second interview that I did with him uh, on his uh, most recent book, uh, which was called M's. Uh, age of M. The Age of M, yeah, The Age of M, um, was the most heated discussion that I've ever had with somebody in my life. So, uh, uh, on the podcast, I mean, not in my life, but on in but my it life. It puts me in good company. I've argued with him as well. I think I think some of his views in the book are flawed as well. Tell me, what was the what was the concept? What was the talk about? The emperor has no clothes. Let's go through the the finer points. Oh well, let me see if I can remember. So so that was about five years ago. But basically, uh, if I remember off the top of my head. The idea is this, so it's about Singularity University. And so first of all, Singularity University is neither about the singularity nor is it a university. So it is a misnomer to say the least, right? Uh, secondly, at the time, Singularity University was migrating from a charity to a uh, benefit corporation. And uh, as it became clear uh, there were a few sharehold, uh, shareholders that emerged after that transition. Um, and those turned out to be Peter Diamandis and Rob Nail, who is the current president. Uh, and basically, my major criticism was that they don't walk the talk. They don't preach. They, they, they don't do as they preach. And that, you know, they're telling others to be an exponential organization, but they're anything but an exponential organization themselves. In other words, they're selling a product that they're not in, in a possession of themselves. They don't know uh, what it is that they're selling because they're not one of those things themselves. Because I believe, you see, from the Socratic point of view, that you are your message. And you have to, you must live your message. And if you're not, then there's a fundamental problem. And it's an ethical problem, but it's also a, a problem of sort of trustworthiness and integrity, right? Uh, and so that was the major issue. Uh, and, you know, there are lots of more finer details. So I, I suggest people who are interested, uh, the video is still up on YouTube. It's called uh, The Emperor Has No Clothes, Socrates Deconstructs Singularity University. Um, and basically in that video also I predicted that 
they are trying to accomplish something which is what's the traditional goal of any startup in Silicon Valley and that's to say to say to go public or to be sold and uh, at the time that was kind of a ridiculous statement and I didn't have that was the only statement I made or one of the very few statements I made at the time which had no actual evidence to back it up at the time but it was basically a projection based on their actions publicly uh, visible at the, that time and then about a year ago we real uh, we heard and it became public information that actually the Boeing Corporation had invested about 30 million dollars in acquiring um, a great share of Singularity University I forget if it's a third or a half now and so today the major shareholders are Peter Diamandis, Rob Nail, and the Boy Co Boeing Corporation and you know that my point going back to the uh, to the original presentation I did in Rotterdam was that there's nothing wrong with you know starting a corporation and selling it and becoming an accelerator which they are but those are very different things from you know solving humanity's grand challenges and once you start serving two masters and one master is like making money and cashing out and fi finding the highest bidder for what you have to offer and the other master is like uh, you know solving humanity's grand challenges in a moment when you have conflict of interest between these two the money would likely win out and you know we know that that's the, the case now because first as I predicted they they were looking for someone to buy them out or at least partially and this is exactly what happened Boeing did and we know Boeing couldn't care less about humanity's grand challenges for a number of reasons so first of all if you just take the civilian part of the Boeing Corporation you know the kind of mess they are in right now with their 737 MAX plane uh, which is a great example of a company cutting corners from safety in order to create more uh, value for the shareholders and and higher bonuses for the CEOs and the whole you know hierarchy there and then when you add on top of that the fact that Boeing is I think if I remember off the top of my head the fifth largest defense contractor in the United States of America you know meaning they're merchants of war and if you go to the largest humanitarian disaster today in the world which is Yemen it's hard to measure exactly what percentage but somewhere maybe between 10 and 15 maybe even up to 20 percent but at least about 10 percent of the weaponry used by Saudi Arabia in Yemen to create a tremendous humanitarian disaster is weapons sold to them by Boeing right so it's very hard for me to believe that a corporation like that right who doesn't clearly care about their civilian safety uh, as much as they care about their profit margin and makes millions if not billions from selling weapons to regimes such as Saudi Arabia of all the places right which beheads dissidents in their own embassy in Turkey which up until recently did not allow women to drive cars and imprisons bloggers who, who push for free speech and all kinds of stuff like that like a number one funder of terrorism worldwide yeah and the Wahhabism and all that stuff is like all kinds of dirty games that are happening there and the source of is Saudi Arabia and yet Boeing does business with them and by the way Peter Diamandis doesn't have any problem going there and, and speaking with them and giving them uh, uh, education about the latest and greatest uh, advanced technologies that that they can pay for and we know they use that technology quite often to for example start hacking the the accounts of the Washington Post which is writing uh, an investigative piece uh, on Saudi Arabia so when you put those two things together which was to solve humanity's grand challenges is no longer actually represented or reflected in the actual organization that you can see today and hence my claim was the Emperor has no clothes in other words they present themselves as these nobly intended uh, people who uh, are going there with the noble goal to save the world <laughs> to solve humanity's grand challenging challenges while at the same time they're trying to find all kinds of ways to cash out as much as possible as fast as possible from all kinds of unsavory 
corporations, states, and people. And I think those two things are incompatible. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think there's definitely points there, but I think there's also definitely issues because if you create a dichotomy where you can't have a business that does good, what it makes me think of is the parody of charity where you're willing to donate money to something that has a really high efficiency or throughput in terms of how much of your donations go into doing greater good. But I also have listened to a TED talk guy was hired by one of the think pink type let's fight breast cancer movements. And he had a budget of $90,000. What he did, he spent a hundred percent of it on marketing and turns the 90,000 into something like 900,000 or $9 million to spend on the cause but he got fired because he didn't spend the money on technically what he was supposed to spend it on, which was fighting the cause. How do you think about the dichotomy of that, where there can be potentially incentives that are misaligned? For instance, should we never have companies that have some type of public benefit type application behind them? Look, I have absolutely no problem with having such companies, and my argument is not against them. My argument is against saying one thing and doing another thing. So if you are a company, let's say like my all-time favorite company in the history of companies is Patagonia, right? Patagonia is a company uh, created by Yvonne Trinard, who is a French-Canadian immigrant to California. And he started a company called Patagonia, for those of, of, of the audience who may not be familiar with it. It was the first, to my knowledge, benefit corporation. And it's a private, it used to be a private corporation, then it switched to a benefit corporation, which is also what Singularity University is. And they actually were giving the example of Patagonia as someone they want to follow. Here's the problem, though. There's a credibility credibility and integrity when Yvonne Chouinard says one thing and then follows exactly to what he says. And I believe him. But the the problem is when Singularity University says one thing and then does exactly the opposite thing, then there's a credibility issue. So I I don't think that companies can do good. They can do incredible good, right? But sometimes, for example, to do good, you have to say no. So, or simply because it's a distraction or simply because you don't want to take somebody's money. Uh, And uh, I forget what was the company, but they wanted to place a recent big order with Patagonia and Patagonia basically turned them down and told them, uh, we we don't want your money, basically, right? Singularity University would never do that. As I said, they would take Saudi money, they would take defense money, they would take Boeing money, they would support a company that goes and bombs people for a living while saying that they are going to save the world and solve humanity's grand challenges. That's the dichotomy I talk about. They would, the, the dichotomy I talk about is the fact that when you organize a singularity summit, everyone is supposed to work for free from the organizing committee usually, or, or most of them, are, are, or at least that's how it used to be, are supposed to work for free, where Peter goes and takes $100,000 for an hour speech. Right? That's the dichotomy. There's nothing wrong with making money, okay? But a good leader, what I learned in the army is a good leader leads from the front, okay? And usually eats last and goes to sleep last and wakes up first. That's what good leadership is about. And if you're a generous leader, you would also get paid last too. But of course, that's not the, you know, the, the leadership that we see there. The leadership that we see there is that Peter gets paid first and then most people down the line get nothing. And which is why, for example, Singularity University, which was started by a bunch of incredible faculty members, most of whom are today gone, by the way, none of them is there almost. None of them got any share of that baby that they collectively gave birth to. As I said, the only two uh, owners from those original people are Peter and Rob. And Rob was even a student in the first year when this thing was started, right? He joined after that first year in 2009 when he was actually an attendee. Then after 2009, he decided to join. But most of the original founding faculty, they're gone. And of course, now they go and they even change the history by 
having people who joined a couple of years ago being called founding faculty. Like the founding faculty were two dozen people and most of them are gone. You know, but this is all the marketing stuff. So there's nothing wrong with a company doing good for the world. And we have many other examples, by the way, beyond Patagonia, but just Patagonia puts the gold standard in my books. Yeah, Patagonia is an incredible company. Yeah, but you have to walk your talk. You cannot say one thing and do another thing. You know, and you have to be generous and you have to sprinkle the benefits. If you're talking about material benefits and making money, there's nothing wrong with that. You can't expect your people to work for free while you're making $100,000 an hour. That's not leadership and that's, in my books, hypocrisy, right? Because you're telling everyone else, we're saving the world. This is a charity. This and that. Come help us for free. And this is kind of like one of the actually detailed problems that I had with. Their business model is designed on this. It's kind of like sort of like the Roman Catholic Church business model, if you, if you will. Everything across the world is not-for-profit organization. All the people who do 99% of the work there, by the way, are volunteers. They get paid nothing. But all the benefits go to Rome. All the money go to Rome. All the credit goes to Rome. And they get both the material and the publicity and the sort of credit at the end of the day. While the actual work is done by the foot soldiers, by the who are like, the, the, not even the priests, by the, by the monks who do all the job, all the work in the end of the day. And to me, that's that's highly problematic, you know. I would say they're still much less problematic than the Catholic Church, but that's a whole other story. Let's not get into that can of well, worms yeah, right now. I, I would agree with you, but at least, you know what? I think the Catholic Church right now, at least, has a good leader. Uh, and at least someone I can respect, and that's the first time I can say that about the Catholic Church in the history of the Catholic Church. I actually think he's a good man. Uh, he seemed he seemed to be much better than the past, but it's it's hard to tell because people also learn from the past. Yeah, and 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 there's you know the Curia, and they're trying to stop what he's trying to do, and there's all kinds of issues. But I've actually put some work in sort of learning about both Pope Francis and about the the Church uh, for the last couple thousand years. And anyway, of its history, and I think as bad as it used to be right now, it's probably the better. It doesn't make it good overall or anything. But whereas with the leadership of SU, I have no faith in them whatsoever. Well, as someone who's from Syracuse and a big fan of Syracuse University, let's put a big hands up for the other SU. So I want to I wanna transition this a little bit. I know in your early podcast, you were much more optimistic about the singularity and transhumanism as a whole. And I feel like you've soured a little bit on both of those. Yeah, you feel correct. And uh, so basically, I started as a fanboy of the singularity, and hence the name. Yeah, since, hence the name Singularity Weblog, Singularity FM, and you know, I kind of regretted it so many times afterwards that I actually gave it that name because then the name kind of became my brand, and now it's kind of very hard to change, you know. But I decided to keep it anyway. So the main problem is this. Basically, I'm, we are witnessing the greatest technological change in the history of the world. And, you know, this is true in genetics, robotics, nanotech, synthetic biology, 3D printing, cryptocurrencies, you name it. So that's absolutely commendable. It's positive. It's tremendous. It's amazing. But what we're forgetting is that all of that can be not only for nothing, but actually counterproductive if we fail to apply it in the right way, in a safe way, in a way which is equitable and fair and just. Uh, and so while technologically we have improved tremendously as a society, and so that's what keeps me opt hopeful at least, if not op optimistic, that trend that technology is more powerful than ever in the history of our civilization it makes me hopeful. But what makes me very fearful is the fact that it seems that we have not been able to find the wisdom 
as a species as per how best to apply and utilize that technology. And we can witness that many actually of our so-called grand challenges are direct result of that problem because there's no such thing as climate change there's no such thing as nuclear proliferation there's no such thing as soil erosion there's no such thing as you know plastic or other pollution in the sense that they're all the same problem just representing itself in different realms and the problem is our technological power far exceeding our wisdom to control and wisely utilize that power. So in other words, the gap between our capacity to do stuff and our ability to do stuff for good without self-destroying ourselves is growing apparently. And that's why we have climate change. That's why we have soil erosion. That's why we have the oceans in the state that we are today and plastic pollution and all kinds of terrible disaster all over the place, right? And so, the good news is that if we actually get our act together in terms of the wisdom part, in terms of how to best apply that technology for the benefit of, you know, all sentient beings on our planet, hopefully, not only for the human species, which would be a good start, but even for all sentient beings, I hope, then with that super powerful technology, nothing is impossible. The, the, the bad news is that right now, it looks like we're not doing that. The bad news is that right now, it looks like we're basically cutting the branch we're all sitting on. And, and, and I don't see it changing, unfortunately. So, so that's, uh, and, and you know, that's, that's, that's what really worries me. Basically, it's the incentive structures and not having a dynamic, well-rounded view of different systems and how they play together. Well, I don't know if it's the incentive structures. There, there's certainly a big part of that. There's no doubt about that. The incentives are all messed up. But, you know, that's where ethics comes to play in my view, right? Because if you just talk about in incentives, then you, you're basically talking about your self-benefit your as a rational self-interested agent. So you're going to say, well, uh, you know, this... In the long run, you know, climate change doesn't pay off, but it's detrimental, so we should stop it. Uh, or we should do something because, you know, in the long run, it would be self-detrimental. I would argue that ethics says that you should do something because it's the right thing to do, even when it's not in your best interest, but simply because it's the right thing to do. And that's where you can sort of ethically override the payout incentives of the game. Sort of, though. That's like asking someone who's obese to live in a house full of junk food and lose weight. In the end, there's enough people and enough opportunities. When, when, when you have to make a decision every time, the decision fatigue wears on you. I would say this is the kind of stuff where we can't expect people to be ethically perfect because no one's ethically perfect 100% of the time. I think we need to redesign incentive systems so that instead of trying to lose weight in a house of junk, you get rid of the junk. Instead of trying to stay sober while working at a bar, you get a new job. I agree, but in the end of the day, that will be only the partial solution because you will always face temptation. You can never avoid temptation 100%. Yes, you can create a system where if you want to lose weight, the the first steps to do is like don't put junk food in your fridge, right? So when you wake up at 2 in the morning, you don't go in the fridge and stuff your face with junk food, of course. But the reality is there will always be a moment where you would face temptation. And so ultimately, you have to be able to say no to temptation. That's where maturity comes. That's where personal growth comes. That's where character comes. And, you know, take somebody like, for example, David Goggins, right? That's what this guy is all about. It's not that the path to get to, to that perfect weight when you're obese, the guy, I don't know if you know about David Goggins, but he was like, he was like, he's called the toughest man in the world. He was like Navy SEAL, Rangers, uh, went through three hell weeks, 
runs ultra marathons of 200 miles at a time through, through the desert, uh, does absolutely incredible stuff, right? And he has this incredible book that I recommend people should, should check out uh, called Can't Hurt Me. And so when he decided to become a Navy SEAL, he was 300 pounds. So he went to a recruiter and, and first he's black and second he's 300 pounds. And there's only been like 37 black Navy SEALs from World War II or from when the Navy SEALs started until today. It's basically a white men's club most of the time by like 90 some percent margin. So when the first recruiter looked at him at 300 pounds where his weight to be recruited as a Navy SEAL should have been something like 180 pounds or something like that, he almost left him out of the room, right? Finally, he found the recruiter who told him, if you lose the weight, uh, I, I, will, I will give you a chance. And guess how much time he had? 60 days. The guy had 60 days to lose 120 pounds, okay? And in, six, and in 60 days, he went through the utterly most hell of hells of hells you can imagine, but he lost 120 pounds. Then he went through hell week, failed because he had an injury, went through a second hell week, he failed again, and went through and succeeded only on the third hell week, right? And so my point is that eventually the ultimate change is not outside, it's inside here. And you have to be able to say no to temptation because you will never have a perfect world in which temptation doesn't exist. So yeah, it helps if you change your incentives. That's necessary, it's insufficient. I would say you're right and wrong. So let's say every time that XYZ person has, every time they see junk food, they have a 1% chance of trying it. Though they're either able to try to reduce that 1% down, but if they're not reducing the incidence, they're seeing the junk food, it doesn't matter. Or they reduce the incidence, they see the junk food, in which case it's a large, large impact. I just feel like as human beings, we're not able, we're not physically able, no matter how hard you are to be motivated, to 100% resist all temptation. I think that's utopia. I think that's what people write about and it always goes wrong. It's called dystopia. But I think we can engineer away a lot of those temptations. So for instance, I think we're, we're kind of dancing around the bush of climate change and having collective problems where something causes a little bit of pain to me, but not very much. So I might as well pollute because you know what, I'm going to make more money than the pain it causes. I don't think we get around those issues ethically. I think we get around them by gaming the, the, the game theory type scenario where we can figure out a solution where this is how we make things where, yes, it's not as ideal for everyone, but it's not worth it to go against that because the consequences, i.e. the fines, et cetera, that go into that are larger than is worth uh, the added benefit of saving 25 cents. I need both, but let's say, for, for example, for the moment that I'm completely wrong, and let's say that we can't find incentives that push us to the outcome that we're trying to accomplish, whether with climate change or something else. So if we can't find the right framework to incentivize people to do the right thing, then do, do we just give up? No. Well, and then, as, as the moment you say no, you're in the realm of ethics. Right. And yes, you're absolutely correct. So so it's it's impossible to avoid it. And so but but not only that, you're absolutely correct that you can say no one's perfect, no one is like uh ideal. I would say almost no one, but we know there have been people who have managed to accomplish that. Right? So for example, Gandhi. Gandhi was able to do that for the latter part of his life, right? Um, Gandhi had shit going on that people didn't know about. Everyone has shit that's going on that people don't know about. And anyone, anyone that tells you otherwise is reading a history book. Sure, but the, the point is that I'm trying to say that there's examples, and you can take maybe Socrates to a certain uh, degree. Socrates surely must have been tempted to keep on living, 
You know, he basically spent all of his life trying to serve his favorite beloved city of Athens in his own work. And to reward him after 72 years of that service, his own compatriots basically sentenced him to death. <laughs> And no one expected, there was a tradition at the time, by the way, that so first he was offered to pay like a penalty fee, and there would have been just a penalty fee as a sentence. But he, he actually knew what he was doing, and he irritated all the, the people in the jury or all his compatriots by saying that he should be sentenced to free meals uh, for the rest of his life, basically like a retirement social security. Uh, nowadays for his service and then they got so pissed off that they said okay when you don't want to pay fee we're going to sentence you to death and not only that but there was still that understanding that when people sentence somebody to death in Athens at the time all they can do need to do to uh, avoid such harsh sentences to basically walk away and you know uh, emigrate leave the country, leave the city, because it was a city-state, Athens. So they just, you know, walk 30 miles out of the city and start living in some village, and it's okay. And even his students already went and bribed the, the guard, the prison guards. So basically the tradition was you give a few coins to the prison guards and you walk out. And, you know, the city has saved its face because justice was carried in the sense that there was a sentence on you. But you didn't have to die. You just go and live the rest of your life somewhere else. He refused to do that, right? He must have been tempted. He loved his life. He loved what he was doing. And yet he decided, I'm not going to, I have served all my life this city. And now it would be hypocritical of me to not follow through on what the city has kind of sentenced me to do. <laughs> and so he drank the poison. And he died. But is that ethics or is that honor? I, I would argue it's honor. But either way, I think it's, I think it's arguing s small points. I think we both basically agree on the important things. And I think, I think personally, unless we change the incentives, we're, in terms of society, we're much further away from building a better world than we are if we try to ethically change everyone. But as you said yourself, if we can't change those incentives, then we're either screwed or we have to find other ways. But we can change those incentives. That's the nature of incentives. Well, but sometimes you can't. There, there are games where the, the payouts are basically uh, rock solid. And I'm not saying that's the case with climate change at all. I'm just saying that in cases where the payout structure is is very solidified, inflexible, then ethics comes to play where you can decide, you can choose to take a course of action which does not follow your, what you're incentivized, but what you choose to do. Yes. Right? It's like, I don't know if you've ever heard about this thing called the Landmark Forum, but it's the most transformational uh, uh, personal development experience I've ever been through. And one of the exercises there is like to choose between vanilla and chocolate, ice cream, or whatever. Uh, and, and so you can say, well, and this is what we do all of our life, basically. Because I come from there and I grew up with a chocolate factory and my parents always taught me that chocolate is the best thing in the world. And because of all these reasons, I choose chocolate whatever their reason, and they may be even coherent logical argument. And then you always end up with a specific outcome, which tends to repeat through time. Because you always have these reasons which basically form a story, a framework, within which the outcome tends to repeat itself over and over and over again. And then one day, you're, you're trying to come out to a new end, but you always end up in the old place. And then the only way out you can have of this situation is if you say, I choose to do these things because I choose to do them, not because of the arguments against them, not because the logic says I should do them, but I choose to do that because I choose it to be done so.
Okay, so here's where we're converging to. We need to use ethics to decide to change our incentive structures. Because if we don't have the ethical fortitude to do that, we're all fucked. And that's, that's perhaps a good bridge, right? Because as you just pointed out very clearly, and, and that, that I agree with very, very well, is that why change the incentives, right? If you don't have an ethics to begin with, because the only way you can even start thinking that incentives are not serving you is if you already have an outside frameworks within which you can evaluate whether the incentives do their job or don't do their job. And so if you don't have that framework, then you have no incentive to change the incentives, right? To have the incentive to change the incentives, you must have an outside framework within which you evaluate the current incentives, you evaluate the current outcome, you evaluate the ideal outcome as according to those, that outside framework of reference that you have, and then you decide, well, the current incentives don't feel don't provide for the outcome that ideally I hope to accomplish. Therefore, I'm not changing my starting framework of evaluation, but I'm going to change the incentives so they provide for this outcome that I'm going for, which could be, you know, stop climate change or stop the species extinction or stop polluting the ocean or what, what have you, or even like lose weight, like you're 300 pounds and you have heart problems and joint problems, obviously, and all kinds of issues and you want to lose weight, right? So whatever it is. Speaking of, I think it pivots nicely. You're in Toronto now. I've lived in Toronto for six months. I would argue Canada is probably the best country in the world in terms of optimizing for the benefit of all and while maintaining the growth of the future. I feel like overall it's one of, if not the leading company, uh, country in terms of what people should be striving for. I'm curious where you think the direction of democracies, the direction of nation states, of people's organization goes. Is it capitalist? Is it socialist? Is it communist? Assuming that we survive the next century. So let me start by saying that I'm a Canadian citizen, very proud Canadian citizen by choice, not by birth. I was born in Bulgaria and grew up behind the Iron Curtain during the Cold War. And I was 13 years old when the wall collapsed. So I became Canadian by choice. I came here alone uh, by myself, not with my family. And I'm very proud Canadian. And I love Canada. And, and as Bono put it once, the world needs more Canada. That's for sure. Uh, and Canada is a very, very, very good place to be, and I'm very grateful for it. But I think, you know, putting away petty nationalism, we can learn from everywhere, and we can learn from everyone. There's a lot of things we can learn f uh, from the United States, despite the fact that the United States has huge problems, just like Canada has huge problems, even though the United States has bigger problems, in my opinion. But we can learn still from the United States about many things. But generally speaking, uh, I think from the developed world, my favorite places to be, you know, I'm a keynote speaker, so I go and, and visit places when I speak. I think the Scandinavian countries in my book are the best example of kind of reaching that balance. And I'll tell you why. So... However you, you look at it, because which country you pick will depend, depend again on that outside framework of reference that we call ethics. And different people have a different framework and therefore pick different countries as best representative of that particular framework that they embrace. So if your framework includes measurable factors such as longevity, happiness, um, health, uh, free time, um, uh, incarceration or crime rates, um, income equality, uh, inequality, yeah, education and health care. I would say that most of those factors are uh, best optimized in the Scandinavian countries. So on average, so just to give you an example between Canada and US, because I know the numbers, they're better. Canadians live almost four years longer than Americans on average. 
right? We are on average happier than Americans, as self-reported. We work less. Uh, the Scandinavians work even less than we do, by the way. Uh, we, are, we, we are better educated on average. We travel more around the world. Uh, we are healthier. We have lower uh, weight. We have a little bit uh, lower degrees of uh, 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 cardiovascular disease and especially obesity. We have lower crime rates. We have better basketball, as we know. <laughs> I, like to, I like to say Canada is U.S. without the bullshit. But in terms of the Scandinavian countries, I, I should have prefaced the question with that. I feel, like the, I feel like they are clearly the ideal, but I think there's two mitigating factors which make it not quite a fair comparison. And one is just the, the size so, and general everybody's the same. So it makes society a lot easier when you have 6 million white Finnish people, at least historically, in terms of keeping social cohesion. It makes things much easier. And it makes much, things much easier economically when Norway has a godload of oil and is able to create a sovereign national wealth fund to an, essentially create a UBI for all of its citizens. It, you know, Sweden took 1 million refugees. I know this is more recently, but they're having a lot of issues now in terms of, in terms of populist pushback, especially from... Yeah, they, everything comes at a price, but they're still much better off than both Canada and the U.S. Okay, I think... Right? So, yes, they, there have been problems. There, there has been trouble. Nothing is perfect. They still live longer. They still have lower crime rates. They, they still have better education. They're still lower weight than us, they still suffer less from obesity and cardiovascular disease. So, so, and by the way, in my books, in my frame of ethics, it takes a lot less courage to build a war, uh, to build a wall, to mount, uh, you know, barbed wire and machine guns on top of it, and and start uh, repelling the people who want to come on that side of the wall. Because this is what basically the Soviet Union did uh, in East Germany. And it takes much more courage to actually tear down walls, to welcome people who are different than you, and start the long-term process, which is very costly, very expensive, and very slow, and you're not going to win always, of basically embracing people and, and lifting people up from different backgrounds and from different cultural, social, religious, or ethnic uh, backgrounds. That is much more courageous, much slower process, much more expensive, and, and, and much more commendable, in my, in my opinion. Let me just give you another example. Last year, Canada took the largest number of refugees. So Toronto is the most diverse place I've ever seen in the world. It was incredible. Well, 70%. 2%, I think, of Toronto. So tell me how is this possible if your argument is true. In Toronto, 72% of people were born not outside of Toronto. We were born outside of Canada. So how are we able to keep social cohesion if 72% of No, that was my point. That's why, Canada, that's why I was arguing Canada was the best country in the world because they had handled these things so well. They'd integrated people so well. They had yes. such a good social system. And we still have a long way to go. We have many failures where we didn't do a good job of that, by the way. Yet we're doing it relatively okay. We're doing it better than most other people. But I think the Swedes are making progress and many others. Denmark is making progress. Uh, Germany also took a million refugees, by the way, too. Germany was the first country, but if you look at size, Sweden compared to Germany, Sweden is like 10 or 12 times smaller in terms of population. So it's one thing for Germany, which is, I don't know, 80 or 90 million people to take 1 million refugee. It's another thing for Sweden that's like, I don't know, 8 or 9 million people, I forget the number, to take 1 million refugees. That's incomparable, right? It's like... 10% uh, of the population almost. You know, it's, it's crazy high number. It's insanely brave, right? So, yes, there will be lots of trouble afterwards. There will be lots of things to be solved on, on an ongoing basis. That, that's a process that will take decades. I think it's still worth it. And just to give you an example, Canada is, of course, 10 times smaller than the U.S. We took more refugees than the U.S. last year. Right? Not, a, not surprised. 
I, and I'm not talking relative, because before that, we always have taken more than the United States relative to our population. I'm talking in absolute terms. Last year, you took 20-some thousand, we took almost 35,000. So not quite double, but maybe 50% more than you. And we're 10 times smaller, and that was only last year, right? So all I'm saying is that it's here. It, and of course, you're a richer country, you have better technology, you have more billionaires, you have... Is that a good thing, though? That's, I think, part of the genesis of the question is, ultimately, in the future, in 100 years, if we're still around, are we capitalist, or has the world gone to a more European, Canadian-type socialism? Well, I'm afraid that if we go... So, so the, answer, the short answer is, I don't know. But my concern is that the situation... And that's another problem that I had, by the way, with Singularity University. So let me hit two birds with one stone here. And that was when I was in Silicon Valley, they would say, look, everything around us would change. This technology is exponential. This technology is disruptive. You know, genetics, robotics, nanotech, synthetic biology, 3D printing, cryptocurrencies, everything we know about our world, life expectancy, longevity, transhumanism, AI, everything will change. But the system that we live in, capitalism as we know it, will not change. And I'm like, how is that possible? Like, you cannot have fundamental revolutionary radical changes here and somehow this part of the system remains independent of them. Like everything is connected, everything flows. So if you have a change here, inevitably you will have a change there. So it will evolve. You know, political systems, I'm a big believer in capitalism because I grew up in communism. And yet I'm a capitalist critic at the same time, if you can believe that kind of contradiction perhaps. Because when I grew up in communism, I saw that it was a terrible, terrible, terrible system. And uh, mind you, we grew up in Bulgaria in a relatively mild form of communism. It was nothing like in East Germany or in, in Russia or in the former Soviet Union. Bulgaria was not the mildest, but you know, not the harshest, was somewhere in the middle. Uh, and so if I were living in, back in the Cold War, I would always run towards the West. There's no doubt about that. And run towards the United States or anywhere else I can get to. But capitalism is like democracy. It's the best system that we know of simply for a lack of a better alternative. <laughs> but on its own rights, in its own merit, it's a terrible system. And I also believe that systems are like people. They're born, they live, and they die. And that's what the historical process is all about. You know, we had hunter-gatherer society, we had the agrarian revolution, then we had feudalism, then we had capitalism, we had brief period of fascism and communism, capitalism overruled. Now we're getting to a point where capitalism either has to evolve and kind of uh, hybrid hybridizes or e sort of upgrades itself some way or another and becomes, you know, capitalism with a human face or in a new way, or we're basically risking to go extinct, all of us, because one thing is clear, we cannot keep doing business as usual as a species. Our planet cannot survive it. There, there was a great cartoon, and you see these two, I think bankers, Wall Street guys, sitting there on the edge of the world as it's burning, and they're like, well, you know, for a while there, we had a good run. We created some solid shareholder value. Yeah. And I, I would agree with you. It seems arrogant to assume that everything can change except something because everything is tied to everything. It's, um, it's one of those paradoxes that I have. And I think we're, I think we're pretty well aligned in terms of how we view a lot of things when it comes to the world and, and the dynamics. I think Singularity University missed their biggest opportunity because they are basically uh, innovating, if that could be called, on the margins, in the safe zone of area, which is basically they create, they're, they've become an accelerator for startup companies. And they believe that basically you can provide new solutions that would save us in the old system. Incremental change versus exponential or stepwise. And I'm saying you have to absolutely radically transform not only the solution but even the system. Does that happen without war and violence? Well, that's a big question. And so, historically, the answer has been no. Uh, I hope we can, we can do better. I hope it can happen without that. But history is against me. 
So ideologically, I hope that doesn't happen again, but, but I would be surprised if it's not the case because historically, as I said, every time that we've had major social, political, economic change, we've had large scales of violence. And now with those, uh, you know, exponential, disruptive and ever more powerful technologies, the, the, the stakes are higher than ever because we're talking survival of the human species. We're talking survival of our whole planet our civilization. Um, Could automation be the thing that kicks that into gear? I, for one, see the U.S. as one of the worst positioned countries when it comes to automation because we don't have a social system of any kind of net. People don't, I, I mean, it's hard to say, but at least the system doesn't care if you make it or not. At least in Europe, at least in Canada, you have something to fall back on. And that I, means the structures are built to potentially build something post-jobs if that's necessary. Right, so, so let me give you the bad news and the good news. So the bad news is that in the United States the idea that if you don't work, you don't deserve to eat is very foundational and very strong. Uh, so people have developed this kind of, I don't want to say lack of compassion, but the foundational idea is you don't work you don't deserve to eat, you're not entitled to medical support, you're not entitled to anything. And if you want to have anything, work, right? And that's fine and all if you're like, I don't know, in the 17th century, uh, you know, uh, coming from the old world to the new world and stuff like that. But today, uh, when you have the high potential of technological employment, uh, where machines can replace, million, replace millions upon millions of people, that kind of old idea may be very, very dangerous. So the good news, though, is that people's mind can change. For example, let me give you two things that basically came out of almost nowhere or surprised us with the, the sort of the speed of development. So first was the legalization of marijuana. Like just 10 years ago, if you tell, there'll be, tell people there will be so many states that legalize marijuana, you know, you, people would say that's impossible. But in basically a decade or so, that kind of, you know, shifted 180 degrees. And the same happened with gay marriage, by the way. And now we're seeing a lot of pushback in some states. Uh, but generally, the public opinion has swayed in favor of both in both of those. And that was not easily predictable maybe 15 years ago. At least most people that I know of and I myself would never have predicted it for the US. You know, it happened in Canada here with the legalization of gay marriage well over a decade ago, I think. But I would have never foreseen that happening in the States as quickly as it happened. So there is hope that people's minds can change for the better and that we can make progress, right? Whether we would actually do that or not, I don't know. And the key question here is, do we invent those machines and that optimization that you're talking about to empower us on the one hand, or do we create it to, in, to replace us? Because unfortunately, going back to your point about incentives, right now the people who are the decision makers have the incentives to replace people, not to empower them most of the time because it's cheaper to have machines. You don't have to pay benefits in healthcare. You know, my wife is a dual citizen, American and Canadian, and my, many of her relatives in New York State uh, do all kinds of jobs because there's benefits. There's healthcare. It's, bu it's such bullshit. I, I agree. I, I, I totally agree with you, but people end up spending decades upon decades of their life simply because they don't see any other way. Handcuff, handcuffs. Benefits. Yeah, it's the golden handcuffs, of course. It's the old story, right? But, but the, 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 the question is that if you are a business owner who makes the decision whether to create a million robots or not to replace your workforce, the incentives right now are aligned to you so that you actually replace those people and not empower them to be more productive or to create more quality or better product because it's cheaper to take care of robots. They don't have a union. They don't require education, healthcare, sick leave, maternal leave, and all of those things. And when they're obsolete, you just recycle them. 
<laughs> and we get back to the incentives argument. Ethics aren't going to be enough because not everyone's ethical. Well, I never said ethics is going to be enough, but I said that incentives are also not enough, and that's why I've been saying that we need both. Agreed. I want to jump to the patron-only bonus section now. If you guys haven't, go to disruptors.fm slash Patreon. We throw in bonus questions with all our epic guests as a way to make the show more sustainable. You ready? For you, Socrates, Mr. Socrates, who loves to bring up the ultimate epic. So that would be if you had one quote or call to action to give people before you tell them where to find you and more about you and your podcast, what would it be and why? One quote. Quote, call to action. It can be something they should look into, something they should do. It can be anything. Technology is not enough. Basically, that's, that's the idea that I want people to consider. Technology is merely the how we do things and how we pursue things. It's not what we pursue and it's not why we pursue it. You know, technology is very capable of making our life more comfortable, uh, easier, and even longer. But it's very terrible at, at telling us why we should live in the first place or what we should do with our lives in the first place. And so uh, technology is the how. It is not the why and the what. And that's why we should always start by asking why. The how is only needed later. Because if technology is enough, what are we here for? I think that's a, that's a good place to start to wrap things up. This has been a lot of fun, Nicola. If people want to check out you, your work, your podcast, where's the best place? Well, uh, you can simply go to singularity.info, and I have links there to everything. Or if you just want to Google my podcast uh, on Google Play, on iTunes, or SoundCloud, etc., it's singularity.fm. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. The pleasure was mine. And hopefully you guys have enjoyed it. If you have, make sure to check out Nicola's podcast. It really is a good one. There's a ton of back catalog. I would recommend speeding them up a little bit. That's what I always do with podcasts. But however, whatever floats your boat, go for it. And until.